leave, or picking up where we left off last week, uh, ready to talk about the pancreas, which is one of those organs that falls in as an organ that has two roles. It's got digestive function and it's got endocrine function. Okay? Most of what the pancreas is, is built for digestion. About 99% of the, the pancreas is built for digestive purposes which leaves about 1% of the cells that have endocrine function. The cells that are gonna have endocrine function produce different types of hormones. You guys are filling in those blanks now, and we'll talk about them as soon as you guys are done doing that. These different cells, alpha, beta, delta, and F cells, all are what we call pancreatic islets. Okay, or islets of Langerhans is a kind of traditional term. The other 99% of the cells are called center cells, and they produce pancreatic juice that's then going to be filtered out down through a pretty ne uh, complicated duct networking system, and that juice is dumped into the, the small intestine. As you can see here, uh, the, the pancreas is nestled in right here within this what we call duodenal sweep. Um, what we can't see, because it's just a superficial view of it, but internally would be that duct networking system, and um, it's connected to the, the small intestine. So the, the pancreas, we'll talk about again here in a few weeks. As far as it's just kind of overall gross structure, um, it's got three major parts, the head, the body, and the tail. Think of it kind of like, um, you know, like a sports pennant, you know, that comes to a point on one end, and, you know, you can see that has the team's name or whatever on it. It kind of has that feature to it where it's a lot wider on this side where the head is, and then it comes to a point over there where the tail is. It's location right there kind of in the middle of the abdomen, but then it kind of points over there to more to the left side. It is a pretty deep organ, and um, what we mean by that or what we mean by that is that it, it is posterior to the uh, stomach. You have to kind of move some stuff out of the way. Um, to find it. Um, it really kind of looks like an, a, a spongy type organ. Um, and uh, we'll, like I said, see kind of more of its internal features here in a few weeks. As far as this image, just highlight the head, the body, and the tail. Not the, the most sophisticated image or anything, but it does have a couple um, things I want you to know. Let's get into the cells that produce the, the hormones. The first cells called alpha cells, which secrete the hormone glucagon when our blood sugar is low. The fancy term for blood sugar being low is hypoglycemia. Yeah, now you can use the term blood sugar, you can use the term blood glucose, it's the same thing, okay? And I, I was taught to remember this hormone and when it's secreted with this phrase, and this is how I always teach it. So we secrete glucagon when glucose is gone. In other words, when our blood sugar or blood glucose is low. So like when you first wake up in the morning and you haven't eaten or drank any juice or anything for several hours, you are probably releasing some glucagon into your bloodstream to try to elevate it. Okay. So how does it elevate it? It converts glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose. Um, so it breaks down the glycogen to glucose. That process is called glycogenolysis. And we can also can convert amino acids into glucose in a process called gluconeogenesis. For you FIS students, we'll get into you know, those processes a lot more in depth than I will here. The opposite of that hormone is insulin. These are uh, hormones that do the direct um, different things for one another, the direct opposite of one another. Beta cells are what secrete insulin when we are hyperglycemic. So that would be when our blood glucose is high. And therefore, we're going to try to lower it, try to move that glucose from the blood into tissue cells. So how do we do that? We form glycogen from glucose. That process is glycogenesis, just the opposite of glycogenesis. And then we can actually convert glucose into lipids, which is a uh, process known as lipogenesis. Lipids, remember, um, if you don't know, are fats. Delta cells secrete the hormone somatostatin, which inhibits the secretion of insulin and glucagon, slows absorption of nutrients from the GI tract. And then F cells secrete pancreatic polypeptide, which inhibits somatostatin contraction of the gallbladder and secretion of pancreatic digestive enzymes. So the, the other two, um, somatostatin, pancreatic polypeptide, you don't hear nearly uh, as much about as you do glucagon and insulin. 
insulin, you know, I'm sure you're all aware is uh, the hormone that is an issue for people with diabetes, whether it's type one and they can't produce it or type two, where their body has become resistant to it. Pictures down here at the bottom. This is just this, uh, the uh, uh, cartoonistic version of what you see here, which is uh, under a microscope showing you those uh, pancreatic islets. You can see the alpha and beta cells are labeled. Not anything that I'm going to ask you now. I just include them because they're in your textbook. But for no other reason. And that. All right. Last slide here is just whatever was remaining all thrown in on the same page. We have the gonads, which are the organs that are reproductive in function. And that's their primary job. They produce the gametes, which are your sex cells. So in men, it's sperm and women, it's eggs or ova, okay? And uh, the organs that are called gonads include the ovaries in females and then the testes in males. Then we will talk about the pineal gland, which we've discussed a little bit about before. And then at the bottom is the thymus. I just, you know, instead of having three separate pages for these three different glands and actually four, when you consider the ovaries and testes are separate, just a safe paper that was uh, just, you know, everything got thrown in here on this last slide. All right, I'm at the bottom. I might as well just start here. The thymus is an organ located behind the sternum between the lungs and rests right above the heart. So it is this bilobed organ here, which we'll talk a little bit more about its um, anatomical features in a couple of weeks. When, uh, actually not a couple of weeks, actually we'll get to that next week when we talk about the lymphatic and immune system, because that's what it is a, a component of. But it does produce hormones that help with what we call T cell maturation. Now we haven't talked about T cells because that's those are within our blood and um, we'll talk about those actually here in our next lecture, okay? T cells are some of the most important immune system cells that we have, okay? Well, the entire thymus is functioning to help us with immunity. And we'll kind of learn a little bit more about that, like I said, next week. Even the hormones that it produces are involved with immunity, okay? Now, a very interesting thing about your thymus is it's very large when you look at infants and children compared to what it is as an adult. Okay, as we get older, it just diminishes in size. Okay? And by old age, it's composed largely of just fat and fibrous connective tissues. And what you see a lot of times is pictures and models don't even include the thymus um, in it. And uh, that's just because it, you know, kind of just shrinks up and um, becomes less and less prominent. Okay? Very easy to confuse the thymus with the thyroid. Remember the thyroid's up there in the throat just beneath the voice box, and then the thymus sits right on top of the heart. Okay. Over on the left side is an illustration showing us the brain again, where we will be able to find the pineal gland, which is, um, as we've previously learned, a small endocrine gland attached to the roof of the third ventricle of the brain at the midline. It is the, the largest part of the epithalamus, made up of masses of neuroglia and pineal sites, which are the secretory cells that do the secreting of the hormone melatonin. Remember, melatonin is the hormone that helps set our biological clock, or in other words, our circadian rhythms, um, not to be confused with melanin, which is that um, protein that we've talked about several different times as recently as just the other day. When we talked about your um, irises, the color part of your eyes. Melanin, though, you know, we talked about it mainly back when we talked about the skin and our hair and uh, its role in giving us the pigment for our skin and hair. Melatonin, they believe, is what you know helps us sleep. Um, we secrete more of it at um, nighttime when it's dark versus when it's daylight. It inhibits it. Okay? Um, and um, you can buy synthetic melatonin over the counter and uh, you know use it as a sleep aid, which is pretty darn effective, especially if you have little kids like my three-year-old that uh, doesn't like to sleep, okay? All right, the ovaries and the testes, once again, are the gonads, uh, but aside from producing the, the sperm and eggs, they produce 
various hormones. The ovaries produce several hormones, estrogens, and that is plural on purpose. It's not an accident. Typically, you just hear it described as estrogen, but there's actually multiple types of estrogen. Um, so that's why it's pluralized. Um, they are involved with the maturation of an ovum, which is a mature egg, and then the preparation of the uterus for possibly arrival of that fertilized egg. The uterus uh, becomes known as the womb when a baby is developing and growing in there. Okay, so uh, fertilized egg will eventually travel down and stick to the wall of the uterus, and estrogens get the, the uterus ready for that. Okay. Estrogens are also very involved with the development of the, the secondary sex characteristics uh, unique to females. So obviously like growth of the breast tissue and you know pubic hair and that kind of stuff um, that develop you know, around puberty and shortly after. Okay? Um, and then closure of the epiphyseal plate, which is gonna result in uh, females no longer growing in length. So they're no longer getting taller. And okay? remember the epiphyseal plate was uh, that uh, growth part of our bones. Progesterone promotes the storage of glycogen and the growth of blood vessels in what's called the endometrium, which is the inner lining of the uterus. Um, and then it also helps with growing secretory cells in the mammary glands. Inhibin does exactly what its name implies. It inhibits. Men actually do the uh, produce the same one uh, or the same hormone in the testes. Does the same thing. It inhi inhibits the secretion of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone by the anterior pituitary. And the relaxin, another pretty straightforwardly named hormone, helps relax the, the body of a female and it's produced during pregnancy to increase the flexibility of the pubic symphysis. Remember, pubic symphysis is a little piece of cartilage between the hip bones so that the, the hips can spread open a little bit more to help with childbirth and also to help with top childbirth is uh, relaxing to help dilate the cervix. And aside from inhibin, the testes produce testosterone, which um, regulates the production of sperm, um, helps maintain the male secondary sex characteristics. So, you know, one of the biggest things is it helps with, you know, growing the genitalia and producing lots and lots and lots of hair. It's also a um, prominent hormone that helps with growing tissues. So it explains why men, you know, typically have bigger muscles, bigger bones, um, bigger organs as a, as a whole. And then, um, Testosterone also does the same thing as what we saw with estrogens, helps with closing the epiphyseal plate. Uh, as far as the pictures here at the bottom, I'm not really worried about you identifying them. Um, so just make sure you know the information. Sound good? Questions or anything? <laughs>